Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. And we'd like to apologize for our absence. I hope you miss us as much as we've missed you. Additionally, you may notice we sound a little different. We're in a new studio, and we're still working out the kinks. Today, we will be discussing an exceedingly imperfect crime. It's about Richard Vincent Merritt, who murdered his mother, Shirley Vincent. We don't really have a ton of backstory on Shirley Vinson, but we know she was a smart, pretty young brunette who did well in high school and was active in her church, the Highland Baptist Church in Mississippi. It's possible she married a boy she met in church because she married young. The Jackson Daily News ran a society piece on her when she was 21 years old. It reveals a happy young bride packing her suitcase. The article reports Shirley was on her way to Germany to join her officer husband, Lieutenant Robert Kenneth Ken Merritt. Wow, the society page? Yes. They must have been from fairly well-to-do families to be showing up there, right? That's what I'm thinking. I tried to go back and look at what their families had going that was putting them on the society page, Mm -hmm. but I never really found any solid information. Okay. So, Ken was in the Air Force and outstationed in Germany? Absolutely. And in case you were wondering, Ken was no slouch himself. He'd started flexing early by winning the grand champion of a baby contest at the local Festival of Progress shortly after he was born. So, his mama flexed. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, he sounds like he had a pretty sweet family, although I'm not sure about a festival of progress. I know. It just sounds so Soviet, right? (laughs) I know. It's really odd. But it sounds like he had a really sweet family. Mm -hmm. How did he end up in the Air Force? Well, I'm not sure why or how he ended up signed up in the armed services, but he'd completed his officer's training at Lackland Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas. That article that I was talking about goes on to describe how Shirley had worked while he'd gone to school, graduating from Mississippi College and then to OTC, and subsequently he'd flown off to Germany. And now they were going to be together in Germany. Wow, she was going to leave her job? What did she do? I'm not sure where she worked, but she was an officer in the Jackson Legal Secretaries Association. Oh, that sounds really cool. But it sounds like... It was pretty traditional for a marriage in the 60s. -hmm. They got married young, and then he can go to work while she finishes up school, and then he'll get the family's career started. That's right. It was very traditional, but it seemed to work for them. They remained married for 41 years until Ken died. In fact, they were kind of the quintessential perfect couple. They stayed busy with their church work and their friends. Ken predictably became career Air Force. He was intelligent and ambitious and ended up spending most of his career working at the Pentagon. Wow. Yeah, he was a really important person. Yeah, he sounds like a real go-getter. Yeah. He and Shirley had two sons, Robert Jr. and Richard. Robert was an only child for about nine years before Richard came along. By everyone's account... This was a great family with a traditional military family vibe. By all accounts, these kids had really nice parents. Rob has very warm memories of his mom working hard to make every holiday memorable and warm. Christmas was her favorite holiday, and she baked and decorated and made sure that her boys had everything and loved it as much as she. And even when there wasn't a holiday around the corner... Shirley was baking treats for her family and friends and making them special dinners, just to make them feel loved. Well, that sounds very sweet. Yeah, I think she sounded like a really nice mom. Ken was working at the Pentagon when Richard was born. Three years later, the family pulled up roots and moved to Alabama for a short period of time before returning to Virginia so Ken could finish out his career at the Pentagon. When Richard, they often called him Rich, turned 13... Ken retired from the military, but he wasn't finished working. 
he took a job with McDonnell Douglas. And what does McDonnell Douglas do? Now it doesn't do much of anything. McDonnell Douglas was an aerospace company and a huge government contractor. They supplied a lot of the planes used in World War II. After that war, they moved into making commercial planes. They designed some really cool stuff. They were heading toward making airplanes twin decks, like you see in the movies. <laughs> but despite an expressed interest from all of the airlines, there weren't any takers. Boeing at the time, you've heard of Boeing, right? Mm -hmm. They were killing it in the 90s. And although McDonnell Douglas had the capacity to build a bunch of planes, they just weren't getting any orders. Hmm. And Boeing, they were getting all of the orders, but they didn't have the capacity to build all of the planes being ordered. So you can guess what happened. Of course, they had to merge, right? Mm-hmm, in the mid-90s. And they merged under the Boeing name, since it was the name that was drawing in all of the orders. Okay. So remember, he's just retired and started working for McDonnell Douglas, and now the Merits were on the move again. This time, they moved to Saudi Arabia, but only for two years. Young Rich returned stateside in advance of his family so he could begin the 10th grade, staying with friends or family in Georgia until his own family returned. His dad became the president of McDonnell Douglas Services in Missouri, and this is where Rich lived until he graduated from high school and went away to college. Wow, his dad had quite a career. He really did. It's an enviable one, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they were well off because of it. He was a good businessman, and according to his obituary, he was a really good dad. Oh, that's nice. So, did Shirley become a stay-at-home mom after the boys were born? She didn't really appear to. She seemed to find work wherever they landed. She wasn't a career girl, though. She held nice jobs. But ones that allowed her to tuck her work around the corners of her children's and her husband's lives. So, again, very traditional. Mm -hmm. Shirley had a reputation for being level-headed and kind. And she was very much in love with her three men. She would do anything for them. And she supported them through everything. Which comes up later in the story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Ken retired from McDonnell Douglas in 1995. He'd had a good run and was ready to enjoy some time with his wife and family. Ken and Shirley made one final move back to the place they called home in Stone Mountain, Georgia. They didn't know it at the time, but Ken only had five years left to live. He died of congestive heart failure while he and Shirley were vacationing in Asheville, North Carolina in November of 2000. That's so sad. Just mm -hmm. five years. Yeah. And I just can't imagine coming back from this, like, much-anticipated fun vacation, but your husband's not with you. And yeah. then you have to navigate all of the logistics of getting him home for burial. I know. That would just do me in, I think. Yeah. I hope she had a lot of support there. I hope so, too. She was very devastated. And she did move forward with the help of her friends and family, like you were hoping. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest helps to her was Ken's cousin, Mike and his wife, Joan, they became even closer to her than ever. They lived kind of far away in Birmingham, Alabama. Nevertheless, she came to depend on them, well, like family. That's nice. Yeah, it's nice to have people you can count on, right? Yeah. So Shirley still had her two sons to bring her comfort and solace. Her oldest was successful and a great kid who was on the right track. He'd married about five years before his dad's death and was as smart as they come. He and his wife had started their family, and Shirley took great joy in their family get-togethers. She and Ken had always been happy to help them out when they needed it, but they didn't really need it much. However, they knew that option was always open to them. That's always reassuring. It's nice to be able to depend on family, right? Right. And Richard... Well, he seemed to be a heavier lift. He'd married his college sweetheart, Janine Minicosi. It wasn't a love at first sight and joined at the hip for the rest of their college years kind of relationship. They dated casually for a while, got serious during Rich's last semester, and then they didn't marry until May of 1999 as he was graduating from law school. Ah, what the kids would call a slow burn, right? Right, a very slow burn. 
Shirley and Ken helped Rich and Janine out financially quite a bit when they first married. They gave them money to buy their first home, and then, after Ken's death, Shirley paid for him to open his own law firm and paid for a lot of other things. And Richard was largely ungrateful. Mm. That's too bad. I think so, too. She seemed to be very generous with her children, and it's sad that that one of them was so completely ungrateful. Yeah, it is very sad. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Jr. says his mom was always wrapped around Richard's little finger. And Richard, always a manipulative little liar, took complete advantage of that. More than 10 years prior to the murder, something happened. I'm not sure what it was, but Robert became estranged from both his mother and Richard. Which is sad, but there really aren't any details. One thing Robert says in an interview may give us some insight, though. He said, and this is a quote, he hurt the one person who held him up and helped him the most, who time after time after time stood by him. Oof, that time after time says it all, doesn't it? It really does. So... Law school. Rich had it pretty easy compared to a lot of people who decide to go to law school due to his parents' financial help. He will claim at trial that he had a job as a project manager lined up with a local internet company before he graduated. But that doesn't really line up with the records that are out there. Becoming an attorney proved difficult for him. He attended a fourth-tier law school. Wow. Given the money that was behind him, he probably should have known to go look for a different occupation if that's the best he could do. I know. There really are only four tiers of law school, right? Yeah, and fourth is dead last. Right. And he didn't do well in school either. And then he failed the Georgia bar exam twice. Third time's a charm, and he did finally pass it, becoming barred in the state of Georgia in March of 2000. But see, that's not at all uncommon for people who go to fourth-tier law schools. Most of them are going to fail the bar at least once. Right, because of the training they're receiving, plus the fact that they weren't really the top of the heap to begin with. Right, right. So that does make sense, right? Yeah, but you know what they say, a pass is a pass, and he's finally a lawyer, right? Doesn't matter how he did, right. But his troubles weren't really over. Once barred, He worked for a bunch of different law firms over a very short period of time. At least four plus another company over a period of 10 years. Wow, that is a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's when he decided he wanted to own his own law firm. So he couldn't get fired? Right. Wow. That would be nice, but that's very expensive. How is he supposed to afford opening his own firm? Um, his mom stepped up and bankrolled his startup law firm in February of 2011. Wow, that's very generous. I hear it takes a lot of capital to start up your own law firm. Like, a lot of capital. I mean, that's what you do when you're the mom. You work hard to make your kids' dreams come true, right? To a point. Yeah, well, a lot of parents will do anything for their kids, as we've seen in the past. Yeah. And sometimes that works out well, depending on the kid, and sometimes that does not. But Rich was fairly rude to her. According to his, I know this is a spoiler, but ex-wife's testimony, (laughs) he wanted Shirley's money, but didn't think she should have any opinions or say about how he spent it. They honestly seemed to fight about everything because of that. Isn't that the way it goes, though? It seems like the kids who are looking for money all of the time, are also the ones who can't appreciate the money. Exactly. Or any other kind of support. Right. And they keep pushing and wheedling for more and more. Eventually, that will is going to dry up. Either the parent will tire of it or they'll run out of money. That's right. Yeah. And Shirley really didn't understand how to move this kid from an entitled little Richard to a man who makes an honest living and stands on his own two feet. Oh, you mean like, if your kid is taking your money and treating you badly, perhaps you should stop giving this child money? Yeah, like that. And when a child is yelling at you or wheedling you for more money than he clearly needs, 
giving in is never in your best interest. Like that. <laughs> yeah. You are no one's human piggy bank, and everyone should remember that. I wish Shirley had realized her value was not in the money she gave to her kids. Yeah, but I'm sure that's difficult to remember when you have the pressure of a child actively extorting money from you, right? Yeah, I think so. You're worried about their future, you want everything to go well. Plus, they're kind of pushing your buttons. Yeah, and you don't want to have a rift and not see them or your grandkids anymore. Exactly. So he kind of was holding her hostage. Yeah, it's a hard situation. Very hard. Anyway, Rich was married, had a beautiful wife, Janine, and two cute kids, a son and a daughter, Jack and Mia. Their daughter had cerebral palsy, and Janine made sure Mia had everything she needed. But Rich didn't want much to do with her. He liked to spend time with Jack. By his report, they did a lot together and were quite close. But he treated Mia differently. Rich didn't really have a lot to do with her or the extra health care her health problems required. Honestly, he didn't really want that quiet family life. He wanted that jet-setter party life that he wasn't quite earning. He and Janine were leaving the kids with what Janine refers to as really good child care mm -hmm. so they could party and jet-set with their friends and have fun. But Rich wasn't making the kind of money they were spending. So when he realized he couldn't make the money and he couldn't get enough money out of his mother, he turned to his clients and began exploiting them by keeping the money when their cases settled while telling them their cases were still ongoing. Wow. It's one of the like, seven deadly sins, right? <laughs> the deadly sin, right? Yeah, he's going to lose his license for sure. Mm -hmm. And long story short, that's exactly what happened. He was indicted on 34 counts of theft by taking forgery and the exploitation of 17 victims. He was disbarred when they discovered he had stolen just under $455,000. That's an insane amount of money to steal from your clients. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it shows how entitled he felt. Yeah, it's terrible. And he's a really bad criminal. He didn't know how to set up a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the lack of effort is always a little insulting, right? Exactly. Anyway, after his arrest on January 31st, 2018, Janine did something in her own best interest. Janine says she had no idea whatsoever that Richard was stealing from his clients. She believed that you stand by your man but not by a great big grown boy who isn't capable of the truth. In addition to bilking all of those people out of their money, he hadn't taken care of family matters. Richard hadn't been paying the bills. He was behind Oof. five or six months, yeah, on the mortgage. He wasn't paying utilities, and Janine said she had no clue that this was happening. That's awful. I know, I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Janine and her children lost everything, including their home and the van Janine needed to transport Mia's wheelchair just prior to discovering his malfeasance. That's horrible. To cheat not only your clients, but your family? And your child who needs transportation for her wheelchair? Mm -hmm. It seems heartless. No sense of responsibility, this man. Mm -mm, none whatsoever. Anyway, Janine told the court at his sentencing hearing for this that they should put her husband in prison, saying, I'm in financial ruin. He squandered every cent we had. That was a quote. Mm. Betrayal of trust is deep in relationships. So after 19 years of marriage, she served him divorce papers five days after his arrest. The divorce was finalized on June 20th, 2018. But Janine didn't divorce Shirley. Oh, that's nice. It's important to stay in touch with grandparents if you can. Oh, absolutely, and especially if they're a good grandparent, right? Mm hmm Shirley had always been a part of the children's lives, as we've talked about before. And she'd attended all of their school, dance, and sporting events. She was a wonderful grandmother in every way imaginable. Janine made a concerted effort to take the kids to visit Shirley and nurture those relationships. But Shirley was mad at her for divorcing Rich and kept trying to coerce and guilt her back into her relationship with him. This caused a bit of contention. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Shirley was one of those moms who felt her son could do no wrong or 
at least shouldn't have to pay the natural consequences for the wrongs he did. She didn't think her son deserved to lose everything. After his arrest, she did what she had been taught to do as a good mother. She paid for a great defense attorney, posted bond using her house as collateral, bought him a Honda, and bailed him out of jail to await trial. And he lived with her as they waited for his trial date. Oh, I'm sure that house was a fun place to be. <laughs> I know. Um, I can't imagine being that son in that house. He was completely unrepentant. He was disrespectful. He wasn't willing to listen to anything his mom had to say. And Shirley could give as good as she got. Really? Mm-hmm. I don't expect that from her. Oh, I know. She seems so soft and sweet. I think she's a very soft and sweet woman, but she also would tell them what she thought. She would read them the riot act if she felt they deserved it in private and support them in public. Okay. So she was mad at him for blowing up a ton of lies with his garbage lies and his greed. And she was really upset and kind of humiliated that Janine was divorcing him. It was very stressful for Shirley to see Rich losing everything for this little mistake. <laughs> of course she would see it that way though, right? Right. I don't understand parents who don't hold their kids responsible for the things they've done because it always seems to get bigger and bigger. It's like they play bigger and better. Yeah, it's hard. And mm -hmm. it's hard at this point to hold him responsible, right? He's too, he's grown up now. Right, but I don't think she needed to browbeat Janine into a relationship just to let him keep the marbles, right? No, and she certainly didn't need to buy him a car. I think one of the consequences of stealing should be being poor. I agree completely. But so, I know she was just trying to take care of him. Yeah, but. I mean, I totally see what she was doing and why she was doing it. It's easy to kind of armchair the relationship looking back on it. Mm -hmm. But I do think parents need to realize that at some point it has to stop. Yeah. You have to stop supporting them when they're making bad decisions. Right. Right. And when they're young so that the decisions aren't life-shattering like this. Yeah. Anyway, Shirley and Janine got a weird surprise when they visited their mailboxes one day. Inside was what everyone described as a scary cartoon. Hmm. I'm not sure I've ever seen one of those. Was it like a threat? Mm, probably not. Most likely just Rich. Ah, so who was threatening Rich? Um, nobody. Rich was most likely trying to scare them. But the cartoon was lame. Here, I have a copy of it. Oh, how disappointing. It's not even a cartoon. Just a lame sketch on a full sheet of paper. On top here it says, Tune in January 17th for another edition of Georgia... Cobb County Justice titled Will Florney Fix Again? And then on the bottom of the page is a sketch of a bunch of men, each one with a conversation bubble drawn on, and they are all insinuating that the judge had given them preferential treatment of one kind or another. And that's it. I know, boring, right? Flournoy was the judge in his case. And so this scary cartoon was basically everyone saying, I know the judge will give me preferential treatment because I'm privileged. So that should be encouraging for him, right? <laughs> right, but it's really weird. Yeah, a little boring, honestly. I agree. Well, I'm not seeing a thread here, but we'll post a copy of it in our photo collection at parasite.org in case you all would like to see it. So, much to Rich's chagrin, no one, just like you, saw this as a credible threat at all. Soon after that, on January 18th, 2019, Richard, with his thinning hair shaved off, pled guilty to all 34 counts of theft by taking and exploitation. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison with 15 years on parole, which is the deal he kind of cut for himself. He asked the court for some time to get his affairs in order. Wow, how civilized. You can do that? Well, when it's white-collar crime, it's sometimes allowed. And again, his mom had stepped up and offered to pay his bond and let him live with her for a few weeks until the date he was supposed to report to the jail to start his prison sentence. He had two weeks. So Richard and his ankle monitor headed off to home with his mom. So house arrest. Mm-hmm. 
He was glad to have a few weeks extra time on his hands. It seems like he spent his time trying to win back the affections of his now ex-wife, spending some time with his children, drinking heavily, and trying to orchestrate an escape. And that's all we have for today. Well, I'm so excited to hear part two, and I'm so excited to be back at it. I am too. I'm really happy to be here, and um, we should probably mention that we've been gone for a while because we've been doing some of the actual research for Parasite and kind of moving along with life speed bumps. But we're back. We are creating new content, and we hope you'll stay with us. So for today, we have to thank a couple people before we wrap up. We have to thank the Atlanta Constitution, Law and Crime, the Morgan Citizen, Fox 5 Atlanta, Clark County Tribune, the Clarion Ledger, the Jackson Daily News, and 11alive.com, and of course, Jade Brown for our music. And you, our listeners, we adore you and we are so happy to be back. We will see you soon. This has been the Parasite Podcast. And remember, always sleep with one eye open. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down.